my name is Liz Heileman from HIV and Hepatitis.com, and we're here at the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections in Seattle, where we've heard some research today about Hepatitis C, and we'll be hearing more presentations a little bit later in the day. So I have with me here some, um, some Hepatitis C experts. To my left, we have Gregory Dorr from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, and then we have uh, Cindy Zand from the University of Bern in Switzerland, Kenneth Sherman from the University of Cincinnati, David Wiles from the University of California at San, Francisco, San Diego, excuse me, and Susanna Nagy from Duke Clinical Research Institute. And I'd like to start by asking each of you to, to start, um, to describe your research briefly, starting maybe with you, Susanna. Sure, so, um, so this morning uh, in the hepatitis C session, I uh, reported on behalf of my co-investigators on the ION4 trial, which uh, assessed the safety and efficacy of lithobispirin sofosbuvir, which is a fixed dose combination tablet, for 12 weeks um, in patients uh, with HIV. And that's and what hepatitis. a lot of our audience might know as Harvoni. It's the, Very the good. brand name. Also known as Harvoni. Yes, so we enrolled a, a large population of HIV patients, in fact, 335 patients. Um, that were predominantly genotype 1 infection, 327 um, were genotype 1 chronically infected. We had eight genotype 4 patients. Um, I think we uh, ultimately had very good representation of uh, African American patients at 34% and patients with cirrhosis at 20%. Um, ultimately, the intention to treat analysis showed an, an SVR, sustained virologic, sustained virologic response of 96% overall. And this um, was true for genotype 1 patients all the genotype 4 patients were cured. We found uh, very high cure rates um, across multiple groups, including treatment experience patients, and in particular, treatment experience cirrhotic patients. Excellent, thank you. David? Yes, so in the same session, I presented data from the Ally2 study, which also looked at sevastopol now in combination with a different NS5A antagonist, the cladosphere. Um, also done, obviously, in co-infected patients, and we looked at both treatment naive and treatment experienced patients. Um, the treatment naive patients were randomized in a two to one fashion to either doing 12 weeks of that combination therapy or trying to see if scaling down to eight weeks of therapy might be successful in a co-infected population. And then the treatment experienced um, group had uh, also about 50 subjects and looked at just 12 weeks of that combination therapy. Um, the HIV positive population that was eligible um, perhaps was a little more expanded in that they were allowed to be on essentially almost any antiretroviral regimen. Um, the only exclusion specifically for an antiretroviral regimen would be a regimen that combined uh, a mixed CYP inducer and inhibitor. So somebody that was on say, Favarin's or Nivirapine with a boosted PI. But otherwise pretty broad in inclusion criteria for antiretroviral therapy regimens. Um, the kind of top line results in terms of SVR12 data um, we saw 96% SVR12 in treatment naive um, patients given 12 weeks of therapy uh, for genotype 1. Um, for uh, treatment experienced patients, it was uh, 98% with 12 weeks of therapy. For genotype 1, that dropped to 76% when we went down to 8 okay. weeks. And then if you, I, I failed to mention, but this study also allowed any HCV genotype. Um, in, in practical terms, it really was um, only the only other genotypes included were 2s and 3s and uh, very few 4s. And if you added those in, the, the really the primary efficacy numbers really didn't change substantially with those different treatment durations. Great, thank you. Dr. Sherman? So in addition to being an investigator on both of the trials <laughs> you, just, you just heard about, uh, my group has uh, several pieces of work that are, that are being presented here. Uh, two of them involving hepatitis C. Uh, one of them is a viral dynamic modeling study looking at one of the older treatments, uh, the use of telaprevir with peg interferon and ribavirin in patients with hemophilia. Uh, hemophilics uh, historically have been thought to be somewhat poorer responders to therapy because of having mixed populations of virus. Uh, we did a small study looking at intensive sampling with modeling and and we're able to show that uh, with the newer agents, including telaprevir, we seem to overcome that effect. Uh, in addition, we looked at deep sequencing of samples from one of the prior ACTG studies, also using peg interferon and ribavirin, and did show that there appears to be some selection uh, pressure as virus is selected, even with peg interferon and ribavirin, that that enhances the proportion of patients that 
that have dominant mutations that would be resistant to protease inhibitors. Uh, and we didn't think such selection would occur with PEG interferon and rapamycin. Okay, thank you. And uh, Cindy, you talked a bit about some of the consequences of, of delaying therapy. Yeah, exactly. The project I presented uh, this morning is actually a modeling study where we tried to assess the impact of deferring uh, HCV therapy until advanced liver disease um, uh, versus uh, treating people uh, sooner, either when they had limited fibrosis or regardless of their liver disease stage, just treating them soon after their HCV diagnosis. Uh, so well, I just want to mention that the rationale for this study uh, was that well, we all heard about this exciting news, the revolution, people talk about the revolution in uh, HCV cure, but uh, uh, the, the very high price of these compounds mean that uh, there is still a major barrier in access to this treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so even in, in rich countries like in Switzerland and other places in Europe uh, that have universal healthcare system, the uh, government had to uh, impose restriction on the use of this compound and to limit their reimbursement to patients with advanced liver disease. So, uh, so basically, uh, we uh, modeled the cohort of um, HIV, HIV co-infected uh, uh, people from the time of HIV um, infection throughout the um, different stages of hepatitis C disease and care. Uh, and uh, we assumed that people were diagnosed uh, by being screened uh, yearly, that all the diagnosed people would be put onto treatment with an efficacy of 90%. And uh, we also made an important assumption on the uh, impact of uh, HCV therapy. So we assumed that uh, HCV treatment would greatly reduce the risk of uh, liver disease progression, but that it would not eliminate it completely um, because people who live with HIV have many right on the risk factors for liver disease progression. Uh, and basically what our model uh, shows is that if people are treated soon after their HCV diagnosis, then the percentage of people who experience liver-related event uh, is, is low. Uh, uh, less than 3% died of liver-related complication. But that if treatment was deferred, so for example, uh, deferring treatment until uh, liver disease stage F3 on the metabolic scale instead of providing it in medieval stage F2 uh, basically doubled the percentage of uh, uh, people who died of liver-related complications. It's an increase from 5 to 10 percent. Okay, and uh, Dr. Dorr is going to talk about another benefit potentially of uh, expanded treatment. Yeah, I think um, the symposium this afternoon, uh, my presentations on hepatitis C treatment prevention, I think the results that uh, Susanna and David presented showing the, the incredibly high cure rates um, are consistent with at least looking at the concept of whether we can use a therapy intervention to enhance uh, treatment potential, uh, prevention potential. Um, some modelling work we've been involved uh, with shows that, for example, among people who inject drugs in Australia, if you treated 8% of active injectors per year, you would eliminate the virus by 2027. So in a modelling sense, it looks feasible. Now, to take the model to implementation is a, a huge task. So in my presentation, I'll be talking about the challenges that we face in terms of treatment prevention. Most countries have a minority of people that are actually diagnosed with hepatitis C. There's very poor infrastructure for delivery of therapy to uh, marginalised groups, in particular people who inject drugs, in terms of getting access to those people that may be transmitting the virus. But one of the projects that we've actually started is a project in the prison system where we started a project in two maximum security prisons where we're having a 12-month leading phase where we're looking at the incidence of new infections in the prison uh, setting, characterising that, and then we'll rapidly scale up with an interferon-free uh, regimen probably from early 2016 and then look at the impact of that rapid scale up on transmission of hepatitis C in the prison setting. So it's very exciting that we can sort of at least evaluate this as a concept. And in the setting of co-infections, another potential area, for example, in Australia, there's only about 2,500 to 3,000 people with HIV, Hep C co-infection, who are largely men who have sex with men, who are generally diagnosed, generally in care at the primary care level and receiving antiretroviral therapy. So our project is to upskill the HIV GP docs who are prescribing antiretroviral therapy to take on Hep C therapy, treat their co-infected patients. Again, the rapid scale up where we get access to interferon free therapy and look at the impact of that on transmission. That's impressive because with HIV it took a decade to, to start thinking about treatment as prevention and here we are. Cure Hep C, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
little different. So yeah. the, the morning session um, was entitled uh, Hepatitis C, um, the mission is accomplished. And mm -hmm. um, I think we, I would like to, everybody to kind of give their thoughts about is the mission accomplished? And if not, um, what might be needed to, to move us forward? So I guess it depends on what the mission is. Um, but if it's, if it's Hepatitis C cure, then I think as a whole, um, it, it, it is accomplished. I mean, we have shown now high cure rates over 90%, um, not just in HIV positive patients, which is clearly relevant for the CROI meeting, but in patients who have uh, undergone liver transplant, in patients who uh, have suffered decompensation of liver disease, and, and kind of the most difficult and neediest uh, treatment population. So in some way, you could argue the answer is yes. But I would argue there's always work to be done, right? So as far as HIV goes, the ION4 trial is the um, is the first phase three trial of current FDA approved regimens, which means we still have a lot to understand regarding um, the, the support of safety and efficacy in large numbers and large populations of HIV infected patients. Um, and, and one of those phase threes will never come because I don't think one will be done with simiputin and sapospavir. Um, and we're awaiting those data um, for the AbV regimen. Um, I think the Ally 2 trial presented today is very important and we're awaiting the approval of that drug uh, while approved outside the U.S. has not been approved yet in the U.S., so it's not something that we can actually clinically apply right now. Um, uh, but ultimately, I guess, you know, I think uh, Dr. Ward said, is it with a question right. mark? Um, I wish it was with an exclamation mark, right. but maybe it's just with a period. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's right, and, and I think, as Susanna just alluded to, that John Ward kind of took people to task a little bit for for the title session, appropriately so, and the, and the big things um, that remain to be done, obviously, are the things Greg's working on in Australia and people need to work on all around the world are getting these tougher to treat populations that are at high risk for both having prevalent HCV infection, but as well as perpetuating the, the epidemic and incident infection, getting them into care and figuring out optimal ways to deliver care to, to tough to treat populations. And that's a difficult thing to do. So, I've been part of this field since the <laughs> beginning, and, and it's incredible how far we've come, and particularly the changes in the last four years. But that said, I would argue that in many ways the mission now is just starting because we have the tools to do it. We have 50% we have or more of people in the United States that, that don't yet know that they have hepatitis C. We have uh, very poor linkage to care for those that have it. We still need to be able to uh, to assess patients in terms of their severity of liver fibrosis, and many of the providers don't even know what liver fibrosis is, uh, and that will affect the, the regimen and the duration of many of the regimens we have now and for at least the near future. Uh, we have very high cost drugs that, uh, that are a barrier. We have state laws and insurers that are doing everything they can to keep us from getting those drugs and using them in our patients. So the battlefield has shifted, but the war goes on. <laughs> How about your thoughts, Cindy? Yeah, I would kind of agree with what you said. I mean, I think it's really exciting, and uh, yeah, mission accomplished, but as long as we get uh, diagnosed and then uh, have an affordable treatment um, to provide to, to the people. Uh, I must agree with Ken. I think we're just getting started. Um, I think the affordable aspect of, of therapy is, is key. At the moment, even to contemplate hepatitis C treatment prevention as a concept at the pricing levels now is crazy. Um, just it's just to not going to happen. Give an idea, happen. there's it's an estimated happen. around 3 it's million gonna, people in the U.S. with hepatitis happen. C and, and the drugs cost approximately $80,000 and upwards. And, 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 upwards. So, um, and even though Cindy, Cindy's work clearly shows that treating people early is advantageous, um, we all have many, many patients with advanced liver disease that we want treatment for now and, and that's our priority right now, to right. treat, to reduce the advanced liver disease burden. Hopefully there's enough competition within the pharmaceutical industry space that the, the price curve will come down over the next decade and then we can broaden access and then hopefully if we demonstrate the treatment prevention uh, can work, it'll be a time when we can really start to get access to people across the disease spectrum, people who are very marginalised uh, and to get the systems in place to really reach 
everyone jumped out to see. But there's a, yeah, a long way to go. There'll be no landings on aircraft carriers. Uh, in the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and finally, to wrap up, does anybody have anything, sort of a message from the conference that they think is a, a message about hepatitis C that they think would be important to kind of make sure that it, it, gets, it gets said? That we need affordable therapy. <laughs> Yes. I mean, access is access, yes, right? Whatever that. Means. Yeah, those, those cure rates are only so good as the people that have access to the drug. Right. Right. And, and, and you were talking about how many places. people are screened. What the screening recommendation now is at least everybody who was born between 1945 and 1965, and and so so far we're not doing very well with that, I guess. But I think yeah. there, there's an amazing uh, potential for empowerment with these new therapies because. Sort of at the individual level, I mean, patients feel so much better, even on treatment. Mm -hmm, often. Mm -hmm. um, and just being a healthcare professional, being able to cure right. almost everyone you treat right. is, in, is incredible. Of course, you want to do it of, as much as possible. Sort of area of clinical medicine yes. to be involved yes. in. So I just hope that there will be this empowerment that will really drive the, uh, the, the sector forward to a point where we can get broad and access. Okay. Well, thank you all for for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, goodbye from Seattle. Thank you.